My name is Tom Kane. I'm the director of the William Joyner Institute for the Study of War and Social Consequences here at UMass Boston. I want to welcome all of the uh, participants, the panelists, the moderator to this uh, Joyner Institute sponsored event on intergenerational dialogue on war, patriotism, and dissent. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, we have an exi ongoing exhibit called Waging Peace in Vietnam about uh, soldiers and combat veterans who returned home and opposed the war in Vietnam. It's a very moving uh, exhibit. And we, last week, we had an opening event there with a lot of Vietnam veterans reading poetry and from their works and sharing their experiences during this very tumultuous time in our country's history. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Mitch Manning, our associate director, who's actually had a lot to do with getting this set up. And I hope we have a very uh, productive dialogue and event, and enjoy yourselves. Hey, everybody. I'm Mitch Manning. I'm the uh, associate director uh, here at the Joiner Center. And uh, it's really great um, that you all are here. And I really want to thank all of our uh, panelists, especially our uh, veterans. And they're all writers, too, which I thought I realized today, that everyone here is also a creative writer. So you said you were a creative writing minor, right? Sweet. So I think it's really great um, that we're all gathered here today for this intergenerational veterans panel inspired by the uh, waging peace in Vietnam, 50 years of the anti-war GI movement against the, uh, the Vietnam War. We, we celebrate veterans a lot in the United States. We celebrate them at football games and a lot of, you know, honorees and a lot of um, patriotic events, especially coming towards Veterans Day. But one thing that I've learned here at the Joyner Institute is that we don't always hear stories of veterans. and We don't hear real experiences of service, of enlistment, of combat, and of the return and what it's like to come back to a country after serving in a war, especially. And so the panel on, has anybody, how many people have seen the show over on the fifth floor of the library? Awesome, about half. So we encourage folks to go over there in the next few days. It's a traveling exhibit that was organized with folks in Vietnam, uh, folks at Notre Dame at the Kroc Institute for Peace Studies, and also with the Institute for Policy Studies at, in Washington, DC. It's touring the country. It was at the Veterans for Peace event in Washington. It's traveled to Vietnam. It's going to UMass Amherst. Then it's going to um, NYU and then to George Washington University in DC. So there's several events kind of honoring the you know, 50th anniversary of 1969 of the you know, fighting in Vietnam there and also of the anti-war GI movement. And according to the show, it says, during America's war in Vietnam, tens and thousands of GIs and veterans created a robust movement in opposition to the war. So there's a real question around conscription and service and you know what Christian Appy at U, um, UMass Amherst calls the working class war and really thinking about issues of, of class and service, of patriotism and what it means as a veteran to sort of confront some of these issues and share. So we're super, super lucky to have four incredible veterans who I've known some for many years and some I've just met and to have a moderator who is also a veteran himself um, and I'll let him tell his story. So I'm just gonna introduce the four panelists. I'm gonna invite them up here, and then I'm gonna introduce our moderator, Fred Marchant, and we hope you folks will um, eat some food from Ballet over on Dorchester Avenue, and also share some of your own experiences, either as a service member or questions you might have if you're a student here on campus to make this really a dialogue. Uh, we are recorded here, we hope to post this online. You know, one of the goals of the Joyner Institute is to be um, a center for open discussion around issues of war and its social consequences. So I'm gonna start, um, Song, do you wanna maybe sit? Can I grab maybe my four panelists and you guys can come sit up here and I'll introduce you. Super, Dave. Mark is on his way in. Cool. So in the middle here is Song Vo. He's a senior at UMass Boston where he's majoring in biochemistry, along with a minor in creative writing, which was my department, so shout out to that. He was born and raised in Boston Maths and attended high school at Boston Latin. After graduating high school in 2012, Song enlisted in the US Army as a combat medic and is currently serving as a sergeant with the Mass Army National Guard. Rachel McNeil over here um, to my left, enlisted in the Army Reserves in 2002 at age 17 before her senior year in a rural Wisconsin high school. At 19, she was involuntarily transferred to an engineer battalion near Detroit and deployed to Iraq with them in 2005. 
She moved to Boston after being medically retired in 2010. And really, this is how I know Rachel and her work. She's the co-founder of three really, really important groups. Warrior Writers Boston, which is a veterans writing group. The Mission Continues, Boston Service Platoon, which is a part of a national program called The Mission Continues that Tony Martin, one of our joiner interns, is currently a member of. Caleb Nelson, a UMass grad, was a part of. It's a really important um, veteran service program. And Rachel's also the co-founder of something called the Greater Boston Veteran Collaborative, a monthly meetup of veteran service groups in the area that talk and share in dialogues like this about how to improve services for veterans. Sitting next to Rachel is Dave Connolly. Dave Connolly was a sergeant of infantry with the 11th Armored Cavalry in Vietnam and has been a Vietnam veteran against the war since. Dave was one of the student veterans who agitated protested for and helped write the original grant for the Joiner Center right here and was an original board member after its inception. Dave's also a great poet and a Southie, proud Southie guy. And Mark Levy was an infantry medic right there at the end with Delta Company, 1st Cavalry in Vietnam, Cambodia in 1970. He was decorated three times, court-martialed twice. His work has appeared in many, many different magazines. He won the 2016 Syracuse University Institute for Veterans and Military Families Writing Prize. Mark has uh, books, How Stevie Nearly Lost the War, Dreams Vietnam, and a book called Other Dreams. And if you are interested, I would totally look at Mark's website called medicinthegreentimes.com. Mark is a really, really important um, cataloger of the Vietnam experience and looking at stories that aren't often told about the Vietnam War including his own. And finally, our host today is the person who got me connected with the Joiner Institute. Fred Marchand is a pro, um, professor emerita at Suffolk, and I took a class with him many years ago called War Literature, uh, the Vietnam War Literature and Film, and was first exposed to the work of the Joiner Institute then. Fred is the author of five books of poetry, the most recent of which is Said, Not Said. He's co-translated with former Joiner Researcher Nhung Ba Chong works by several Vietnamese poets, including books by Trang Dan Kuo and Vo Quê. He also edited a very important book, Another World Instead, the early poems of William Stafford, when William Stafford, the poet, was a conscientious objector during World War II. And Fred has also taught pretty much around the entire country. He's worked with the Veterans Writing Group in San Francisco, connected with Maxine Hong Kingston, and Fred has been a really, really important part of the Joiner Institute Writers Workshop for 20 years, and Fred has really lived and breathed these questions that, and experiences that we'll talk about today. So I'd like everyone to give a warm welcome to our four panelists and to Fred. Hi, everyone. Isn't it great to have all that food over there? Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to the Joiner Institute. Thank you. Uh, and I want to second what Mitch said. Of those of you who haven't been over to the exhibition, I just was able to squeeze in 20 minutes. But it's stunningly important. And um, so thank you, Mitch, for doing, bringing that exhibition um, to us all here. I'm going to begin. I'm going to try to set a little tone and then say a few words about what we're going to do. And this is pure Joiner Institute um, um, benefit, which I'm going to say. Nguyen Chai, T R A I, was a poet uh, of the 16th century, 15th century, the edge of the century, in, um, in what, was, what is now Vietnam. He was also a general, a reluctant general, who rather, would rather have retreated to his um, um, cabin, if you will, in Khonson Mountain, south of Hanoi. But he was such a good general, he, they kept calling him back. And ultimately, he was such a good general, he was assassinated. Uh, even though he didn't want power, he, was, he, he apparently threatened the powers that be. In any case, in terms of Vietnamese literature, he's a central figure in the shift into um, writing and using the Vietnamese language as a basis for literature. Here's a very short poem by Nguyen Chai. Occasional verses at Khon Son after the war. Ten years away from what I knew and loved as home. 
I return to pine and chrysanthemum grown rampant, to patient streams and trees wondering where I've been. I am covered in dust. There was nothing else I could do. Now that I am home, my life seems nothing but a dream. The war may be over. I may be alive, but I want nothing more than a cloud-tipped mountain, good tea, a stone pillow. Well, we have good tea, and we hope to have um, a little bit of an examination of this whole question of an intergenerational dialogue um, um, among veterans and among us as citizens about the wars of our time. There's a cliche, I heard it all my life, we probably internalized it somewhere, that, that, that every generation has its own war. I argue with it, of course, we all argue with it, but it's there, it's there inside our society. Uh, and I was thinking about that today and thinking, yeah, that's partly because there's never not been a war, right, going on. Certainly in my lifetime, I was born in 1946, there it is. You know, I inherited World War II, was, came of age in the era of the Vietnam War. I was, I was in the Marine Corps for two years. I left as a conscientious objector in 1970, not in Vietnam, from Okinawa. Um, but then, then, you know, in the aftermath, these other wars that, same, that, that seem to sort of like come in waves, like I keep thinking of the, of the way surf rolls in on the West Coast, you know, a series of them, wave after wave, and bigger waves, obviously. And then there's something else that was inherited. We all know the cliche about the silence of World War II veterans. Well, it isn't a cliche. I mean, it's a cliche in part, but, but you know, there, is a, there was a silence. I think experientially, those of us who um, are the generation after know that there was this strange silence. The Vietnam War veterans, of course, were not so silent, but there were those welcome back issues, right? And, um, of course, the questions of the, you know, of the, the moral bankruptcy of the war, the ongoing justifications for it, even as those things got translated into other kinds of social questions in our society. And then um, not, <clears throat> there was the first Gulf War, which we can just sort of elide, although I don't like doing that. But I'll sort of say there was the Gulf War, the Iraq War, and the Afghanistan War. But, you know, in between the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, and those other two is 9-11, which then altered the discourse in another way. It wasn't so much... Um, I mean, there was an echoing, a kind of looking back with yearning toward the good war of World War II. There was moral justification at having been attacked. The Pearl Harbor of that generation, if you will. Now, I don't, have a, I don't pretend to explain the dif differences in discourse and the difficulties in speaking about these various kinds of wars. But what I'm going to say is this, as a hypothesis to my friends to my left. My hypothesis is that one reason it is hard um, to have a dialogue about these wars and the experiences thereof, is that each person involved in them does not want that experience to be betrayed or be rendered false or inauthentic by being subsumed into somebody else's idea of that war. I see this silence as guarding the parameters of the experience. And it's an effort at integrity, and it is an effort to not let there be a false narrative in fact, each of those wars I mentioned are different from one another in the causes, the consequences, and the ways of life and death within each. So, and at the same time, look at how this happened so naturally. When we were planning the seats up here, we were going to put the Vietnam veterans together and the Iraq-Afghanistan veterans together, and all of a sudden they wove themselves together into a, an alternating group. We're all the same. Exactly, I wonder, well, maybe not. I mean, let's, that's what I'm getting at, actually. You know, yes in some ways and no in some other ways, and that's why we're here. You know, it's, it's very reasonable to, to think that um, there must be through lines, there must be connections, continuities, overlaps 
between these ex among these experiences. And it's also just as reasonable to uh, articulate the differences, the specificity of one's experience. So what we're going to do is we're going to think through the overlaps and continuities, the specificities and differences together. I invite you as an audience to sort of think with us. Um, there are some questions that we asked everybody to consider, um, and we'll probably work our way up and down uh, the um, the table. We will save at least 20 minutes for interchange at the end with you as an audience. But if anything happens up here that just makes you want to throw your hand up, please do. All right? We'll call on you, in other words. Um, I'm going to outline the general questions. Each of our panelists have been asked to think about our fundam the fundamentals of their military experience why they entered, what their work was, what the nature of their experience overseas was, how it changed them, and what it was like to come home. We've also asked each to think about how their experience changed them as citizens thereafter, e.g., um, how they might have engaged in political activity as a result of their experience in the military. Uh, and then finally, uh, we'd, like, we'd like each of them to consider some fundamental differences between um, their generational experiences and then some, fun, you know, some fundamental through lines. So having said that, I'd like to sort of just, Mark, could we start with you and work our way down to Rachel? No, Rachel, could we work with you and work our way down to Mark? Sure. Okay, I'm gonna start us off, all right? Point. Actually, I think that I, that we, I was gonna sit in the middle, but I think now I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab a, the, the loose microphone. I think that's what I'm gonna do. And walk out in front of you. You know, the first question that came to mind was, you know, um, how did you get in? How did it happen? Were you, were you, in some cases, were you drafted? Did you enlist? Why did you enlist? What was your thinking? How did this, how did you end up in uniform? Rachel, would you begin? Sure. Um, I, I guess I could start to say, but I, w I was in uniform unexpectedly. Um, I typically avoided the recruiters. I, uh, when they came to our high school and they heavily recruited from rural high schools. Uh, I had about about 30 people in my class and uh, probably five of us were in the military um, within a few years of graduating. Um, after 9-11, which happened during my junior year of high school when I was 16, um, I really couldn't um, look away from what was happening. I remember sort of watching the news and feeling like, you know, I don't know if you remember, they had like these like, like almost like kind of like a, you know, between yellow and green, like the terror rating, like, you know, how big the, the threat was. Uh, and I remember sort of watching TV and feeling like, you know, there was something going on there that I would never know, like I, that it just, it didn't seem right. Like it seemed to, um, the idea that we would go to war in response to 9-11 just seemed like, um, Excessive, like I, I don't know. I had this thought process that, like, we, you know, sort of learned that war is not really a particularly effective first resort um, to solve problems, um, and I really kind of had a hard time wrapping my head around it. Um, and by the time I was 17, I kind of figured out that, like, I could enlist. That um, that was something that was open to me as an option. Um, before 9-11, you know, I thought maybe I would go to law school. I was like always writing petitions when they tried to give us dress codes. Like I just kind of had these thoughts that, um, you know, that's what I would do. But after 9-11, it seemed like the future was less clear, um, you know, where, where we were. Um, I had also kind of read some books prior to this. Uh, one that really stands out that was really impactful for me was called Death of a Generation. It was written in the 70s about World War I. Uh, and I remember kind of thinking about that and thinking about um, the first chapter, which basically was, you know, the trenches were dug. That's the first step. And 9-11 felt like that. Uh, so it seemed kind of inevitable and like that this was what uh, the gift to my generation was going to be. And um, ultimately, I did enlist when I was 17. Um, I became a construction equipment operator. 
uh, which was sort of based on the openings in my area and also uh, you know, working in the summers as a construction laborer uh, during high school. And um, that kind of sparked my interest. So I ultimately went to training, um, did uh, stay with my unit for uh, a little while, but when I was 19, I got orders involuntarily transferring me to a unit in the Detroit area so I would ultimately deploy with people that I didn't know. Um, I didn't know that was really a possibility, um, but as I learned, it was. Uh, so I went to Iraq for all of 2005, um, really having no idea how to operate construction equipment beyond like the week or two of training that they did. Um, so I, I did do some construction operations early on, but um, I guess sort of the original reasons that called me into the military also eventually led me to um, volunteer for a tactical movement team um, where I was a driver and a machine gunner uh, under the Second Marine Expeditionary Force. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Could I ask you a slight follow-up question? When you enlisted, how many women were around you? How many other women? Uh, <laughs> Basic training, I think there were maybe 60 out of 200 and some. 60 out of 200. They, uh, you know, we were separate, but we trained together. We had like our own separate area of the barracks. Um, but they would take the women out pretty regularly in the middle of the night, smoke us, make us stronger, stuff that the guys never had to do. In my unit uh, that I deployed with, there were maybe tw 25 of us, I think, in my company, but just one other woman on the tactical movement team at any given time. Uh, David, I think that, don't you think that that would be a significant difference, a specific difference, the, the role of women in the, these wars versus the war? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the only women I saw in Vietnam were, were uh, donut dollies or the nurses when we got hit. So there, there were no women in the ranks, you know. Uh, I have stood up and I have stood up and lectured at South Boston High School with Rachel. Uh, and she's, she's got more guts than most guys I know. <laughs> so, yeah. David, David, how did you end up? In, tell us a little bit about Well, my, I grew up in Southie, and my grandfather was, was uh, in the IRA and, and was uh, in the Black and Tan Wars fighting the British. Uh, and, uh, and Capone used to tell me those stories. and. Uh, my dad and his only brother both joined the military on Pearl Harbor Day. Uh, my dad was in the Army. His brother was uh, a CB, uh, UDT. He would have been a SEAL today. Uh, uh, both hurt. Uh, uh, but I grew up in Southie, very conservative, very close-knit. Uh, and it was my job to join the military. There was a war and my generation and I was going. Uh, and I, uh, I asked for it all, volunteered, volunteered infantry, volunteered Vietnam, because I didn't know we were being led down the garden path. Just, just as a matter of clarification, um, how, long, how long did you sign up for? Three years. Three years, and Rachel, you? Uh, eight. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. And what, David, what happened then? So, um, Well, I, I went to basic and infantry school and jungle training down at, uh, in Panama, Fort, I think it was Fort Sherman, uh, and, and was deployed to Vietnam. I got there on the 2nd of February, 68, just as the Tet Offensive was starting. And when I came down off the stairway, from the plane, there was a black sergeant first class and two young black specialists, and they were handing out M16 rifles and bandoliers of ammunition. And the black sergeant first class said, he said, yeah, you're here to kill, kill any you see. Now I had just come 10,000 plus miles to help these people. And I, I knew what was going on, even though the day before, Walter Cronkite said we were winning the war. He could see the light at the end of the tunnel. But I wasn't surprised at the thing because uh, in all my training, I had never heard the word Vietnamese. I had heard 
And, and I knew they were trying to brainwash me, but the British didn't like the Irish much either. We young Irish kids during the, the, the rising and the black and tan war were nits who would become lice. Shoot them. Uh, so I wasn't buying any of that, but I couldn't get on the Bayview bus and go home. So the only way out was through. All right, we're going to leave you there for a minute. <laughs> For just a again. minute, all right. Um, Sangvo, and how did you, how did, did I say your name properly? Uh, yes. Good. Um, how, how did it happen to you that you were, ended up in the military? So I remember like it was yesterday. So I was on college board looking through colleges, um, and one came up the United States Military Academy. Um, so from there I got, you know, I was really thinking, oh, yeah, the military. And, I was, and then from then on, I went to the Army website and really thought about what I wanted to do in my life because I was just a senior in high school. I really didn't had a sense of purpose. Um, and I felt, you know, going to college, I would be lying to myself. So, you know, I've, I looked up uh, certain jobs and I went down to the recruiter. We talked about uh, some of the jobs that they offered. A lot of it was like uh, field artillery, infantry, uh, supply, and then combat medic. Um, so the biggest issue that I ran into was that how I was gonna, because I was 17 and I needed my parents. So I had to persuade them hey, you know, how, how can I really do this? And, you know, they're, they're Vietnamese, they're really conservative, um, and they generally would, you know, be a bit disappointed in me for going to the military. So I had a great idea. So I brought two recruiters to my house for dinner one night. One of them happened to be Vietnamese, which is um, you know, Sergeant Huynh. Um, so he, he worked at the recruiting station, so he decided to help uh, my recruiter. So they both came down, and they, like, uh, talked about it, and then um, we got their, I got their signature. Um, so, from, from, yeah, from then on, I, I got in, got the uh, combat medic contract and, uh, for four years. Four years, and that, that, that uh, there was a Vietnamese sergeant yeah. who was in, recruit, it was. in recruiting yep. and came to your house for dinner. Yep, for dinner. Yeah, you had no chance, <laughs> I was, you know, and you, and you are Vietnamese by descent. Yep. Yeah, and your, your parents came to this country when... Yes. When, uh, so in the early 90s, in the um, early 90s. They, they came from, um, I guess, my grandparents came right after the, uh, the Vietnam War, so they were refugees. Uh -huh. So then they brought my parents over. I see, then, um, I see. Good, thank you. And did you say you signed a combat medic contract? Yes, as, and, as a job. Yes. And that is what happened? You, you became a combat medic? Yes. yes You're also so. sitting next to one. Do you yeah, know yeah, that? So, yeah, okay, it's, it's good. Mark Levy, would you tell a little bit about your, the beginnings for you? So I was uh, about uh, 18, I was uh, drifting, I dropped out of uh, junior college, uh, lousy home life, two crazy parents, and I was uh, politically and morally naive, and my parents thought that Time Magazine was the source for informed opinion. So I, I was open to the army propaganda, uh, went down and uh, to see a recruiter, and then uh, uh, went and enlisted in the navy. But I rushed through the the ex the exam, the entrance exam. I wanted to be a medic in the mar <clears throat> in the marines because I like the uniform. That's a true story, and uh, I failed. I was the first guy in this room of about 50 guys to put this pencil down, and I failed. I was anxious, and I, and I flubbed it. And so uh, I waited a while, and then I thought I'd enlist in the Army. So I went down to the Peter Rodino building in Newark, New Jersey, after seeing a recruiter, and took their exam, and then I, I passed. And then I was called up a while later to go to the physical exam and same building it's like a it's like being in a, on a in a farm just in a room full of cattle and you're going from one little health station to the next they check every part of your body you start here and they end down at your feet and everything in between and i get to the last one i'm done and uh we're just a bunch of us just hanging around like sheep waiting to be slaughtered frankly and the sergeant comes over and calls out my name and says, uh, open your mouth. 
So I opened my mouth and he, he says, you got braces. I said, I, yeah, I have braces. And he said, uh, he called me birdcage mouth. And he said, get the fuck out of here. Pardon my French. And that was that. The army will not, at that time, take you if you, if you have braces. Because they don't want to have anything to do with the, with the maintenance. So I saw my, my orthodontist. And I didn't know it, but he was a colonel in the reserves. And uh, a year later, he told me that uh, parents would pay him, offer him bribes to put braces on their kids. And even he advised me not to have them taken off because we weren't done yet. But I said, uh, no, I want to I be in the Army. I want to be a medic. So long story short, he took them off. And, uh, and I went back and uh, got on a bus eventually to Fort Dix. And uh, 50 years later, here I am today. Thank you, Mark, and thank you. You know, one of the interesting things, every story, when we start to really do this, every story is unique, right? It is really the, 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 the sort of specific, I mean, I've never known the orthodontist story before, and we've known each other 25 years. And, um, and it is so interesting, and I, this, I'm gonna shift gears, I'm gonna put the clutch in. This, now we come to a harder part, all right? I'm gonna ask each of you, if you would, to tell at least one story that is really uniquely yours about your time overseas in any capacity. And obviously, um, you know, they may veer into all sorts of, you know, um, terrible and painful things, or not. There's no requirement here. This is meant to be a, an intergenerational dialogue. And so what, what comes to your mind is really what matters. I think we'll go back to the beginning, Rachel, if it's okay with you. Okay, Mark just sort of was working out, right? Okay. So, uh, my military experience was all, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a planner. <laughs> sort of, you know, thought I would be operating construction equipment, bulldozers, things like that. Um, and there's a ton of stories I could tell because I stupidly volunteered for everything. And one of the missions I volunteered for was a tactical movement team. Um, so about maybe four months into the deployment, um, my company and another company were um, shifted from the Samara to Crit area in Iraq into the Anbar province. And we were based out of um, Camp Ramadi, which um, at that time, things were starting to uh, go very poorly uh, in the war. And they started to ship the Marines to do um, sort of door-to-door -door operations, and uh, part of that was that they created these tactical movement teams, which was essentially they came to um, the, the engineer companies and other support units that were there, and they um, took about 25 people, um, either people who were voluntold or who volunteered, and um, basically the Marines trained us to um, fire machine guns and to do operations to move convoys through um, black routes in the city were basically routes that were known to be um, the most dangerous. They had high levels of approval to be able to travel on them. And I ended up on a team um, that was the only one that was authorized to travel through the city um, on any given day. Uh, in late 2005, like October, um, there was a Ramadan offensive. And um, this, you know, by then I had no real grasp of like how crazy it actually was. Like I was very much used to what was happening, volunteered to stay. <laughs> Fortunately, they didn't let me stay. But during the Ramadan offensive, um, a lot of the smaller bases were sort of at risk of being overrun. We didn't have a lot of security around them. Um, one base in particular uh, was called Camp Corregidor, which was um, sort of like living on a bullseye. Uh, you know, we sort of had a breakfast, lunch, and dinner rocket attacks. So you knew, like, you know, kind of what to do, what to watch out for. Um, and where normally they would have, like, heat cat five, which is, like, you work for 15 minutes, you take a 45-minute rest because of the temperature. We sort of had that for attacks. So if you went and were doing a mission at the law college as part of, like, the conversion of all of the colleges in the area to bases um, that, theoretically, the Iraqi army would take over, um, we... Uh, we could, you know, the group would work for 15 minutes and then they would have to go under for 45 because then the rockets and everything would come in. 
So on this particular day during the Ramadan offensive, um, it was coming off of a series of attacks against some of the um, Bradleys in the area. So they were taking out entire Bradley crews uh, with like triple stack landmines. Um, obviously, Bradleys aren't meant for urban warfare. So it was um, kind of a precarious balance. Um, on this particular mission, we came to the base, went from one base to another. It's like maybe a 15 minute run, you go as fast as possible, and you have you know, usually a dozen or so semis in tow that are fully loaded. Uh, we were attacked on the way. I don't remember exactly which attack it was, but um, we got to the base, to Corregidor, and um, there's no real place for us to hunker down because everybody was sort of stuck there. So the, they called it Full Metal Jacket, where uh, everybody stayed. Um, so we were like all kind of parked outside of there, and um, we came under pretty severe attack. Uh, so a bunch of people in my crew were injured, and then um, when we responded, since I was a combat lifesaver, which is basically the first person to go in when we wait for the medics to get in, um, another round of rockets came in. Um, somehow missed all of us. Um, but we had to medevac everyone, uh, kind of get our people out. Uh, it was, a, at the time, just a normal kind of experience um, for our our team because we were kind of constantly in these operations. Um, but what kind of became defining about the experience was um, really after I came home. And that's when I discovered that women are not actually in combat um, because I went to the VA and you know they always ask me like, well, what's the one thing? You know? um, and so that was look, the one thing. And, and um, this gentleman who had served in the Navy in the 80s um, informed me that I was probably imagining someone else's experience as being my own, which, uh, you know, was super <laughs> helpful. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it, so it uh, really became a defining thing because um, there was no, it, it was almost as if um, there was a denial, like, versus it being because of my gender, which, I mean, I think it, it was ultimately, I think it was also partly a denial of, you know, what was actually happening in the war, um, that they would have me in that situation. Like, he just couldn't fully process it, so he went to the rules, which is, you know, technically, women are not allowed in a combat role. And there I was saying I was a 50 cal gunner. Thank you, Rachel. And, and, and really, and you brought, you brought us to that really weird uniqueness, right, in, inside. I mean, first I wrote down when you said this was normal, and then then it became really abnormal, didn't it? And you and and you in your tactical team, were you the only woman in that group? Um, there were three, but there were usually only two of us on mission at any time because they had to have a like a, a buddy, right? They uh -huh, had to have another sure, woman in case sure. we got put on a base where they didn't allow us to bunk with the men. So um, there were two women who were NCOs. I was the lower enlisted. You, and what was your rank then? Um, I left as a sergeant, but during uh, my deployment, I had only been in for a couple of years, so I was a E4 specialist. Uh, all right. Thank you. I should say to everyone that one of the things that all of the panelists were told by Mitch is that they feel free to bring poems or other writings if you want to read something, you know, and I, I out of the corner of my eye, I just happened to see, you know, my esteemed colleague, David Connolly, reaching for a book. And so, you know, David, are you thinking about that? Yeah. All right, well, please feel free. And, and if, if you would, just give us some context of the, the, what I'm really looking for here is a way of floating out into the air, the, the, you know, something that says something about the specific, unique experience of your own. Well, I, when, you know, I spent my first month and a half uh, in Vietnam in the cities during the Tet Offensive, subjugating the cities. And then we went back out into the countryside to pay the people back for, for staging the Tet Offensive. Uh, the nature of the wars changed from, from, uh, from fighting for the cities to search and cordon, search and destroy, burning villages, you know? Uh, I heard Stories from my grandfather about how the black and tans would come through the villages in Ireland and search for arms and ammunition and foodstuffs out of proportion for the number of people that lived there. And if you had too much food, that meant you were helping the IRA and the, uh, the black and tans or the Tommies uh, would burn your house down. 
uh, or the whole village. Uh, that's what I did a whole lot of time with surrounding Corden villages and, and I'm just, uh, I, I got hit once and, and broke my skull, my nose, my cheek, my jaw, my neck, my clavicle and my shoulder. Uh, 10 days later, I was back in the jungle. Like, I couldn't even hear. I couldn't see straight, but they threw me back out into the jungle. The next time I got hit, I got hit twice in one day. Uh, and that was the end of my, of my experience in Vietnam. Uh, I'm going to read something that's kind of explanatory. Uh, the term Matty Mattel is about the M16 rifle, which was low bid contract crap. Uh, the AK-47, which our enemies were armed with, was probably the best weapon ever devised for close combat. There are... Uh, MoGas is military octane gasoline. Our armored personnel carriers, when I first got there, were powered by regular gasoline. And so if they got hit, if an RPG pierced the skin and pierced the fuel tank, it went off like a Zippo. Uh, I've had to pull skeletons out of APCs because of that. Magnes magnesium illumination refers to not only the ACAVs as they burn because they armored, armored cavalry, armored cavalry assault vehicles, ACAVs. They, they were not tanks, uh, and they were not armored with steel. They were armored with uh, an aluminum magnesium shell, which was lighter, so they didn't use so much gas, but they fucking burned like, uh, when they lit off, they burned like it was magnesium. To set this up, uh, my team was had dropped everything we had in the jungle except for our small arms and my radio, a PRC-76. Uh, and we were running towards an armored cavalry troop who were about to get their ass kicked by a battalion of North Vietnamese Army. And we wanted to warn them. By the time we got to them, they were already trading shots. They had circled the wagons like in the old cowboy movies. And they were trading shots with the NVA, trying to, everybody was trying to figure out where everybody was. And that's how I entered the picture. They couldn't call in artillery. I had a secure set that had longer range than even the tank radios. So I was standing up on top of an armored personnel carrier trying to call in artillery that I had registered that afternoon with Husky Artillery and Sodlock. And the next thing I knew, I was standing 20 feet from an ACAV that was burning. Uh, I still had the radio handset in my hand. I was no longer wearing the radio. Uh, most of my pants were blown off and my guts were dangling down the left side of my body. Uh, I was knocked down by a medic. I didn't know people were shooting at me because I was deaf from the explosion and dragged into the middle of, of this, this horror show. and. Uh, shut up with morphine, and, and that's where this begins. I watched the Viet Cong soldier, a stay behind. They used to set up ambushes and they'd leave men as stay behinds so that they could uh, direct the battle from inside any perimeter we set up. That's what happened. The little man. All of a sudden, I see him standing there just like that, like he dropped out of the sky. He's inside the perimeter we threw together when we were ambushed, the stringy little brown rice propelled killing machine. Floppy hat, black shirt and shorts, his folding stock AK held close to him in his left hand. He's facing away from me, aiming at my brother's backs so I can't see his face. I notice the cover of his spider hole as he kicks it away. His head swivels. He's lining up his run through our hasty defensive position and his target's on the way out. 
My brothers are all facing outboard, away from him, intent on the jungle, the fire coming from it, and their own outgoing fire. I can't shoot them. My Matty Mattel is gone, blown from my grasp and into little pieces earlier this evening by a B-40 rocket that also broke my arm. I can't even get up to find a weapon. The first fusillade of this contact, a flurry of anti-tank rockets, has left me flat on my back, 20 feet from the track I was standing on as it merrily cooks. My guts, poking through the hole in my pants, shine wetly in the mo gas and magnesium illumination. They sparkle as if they're iced. I strain to reach the medic to tell him about the little man, but he can't hear me. There's too much gunfire around us, and he's too busy with the guy he's working on, who's really chopped up. The medic's arm, all I can really see of him, shiny and black with blood, filling the fetid air between us with its biting scent, reaches over and pushes me back down. So I begin to scream, get him, get him, that bastard right there. Jesus, somebody get him. Across 20 years, I scream, and no one seems to hear. Not the medic, not the brothers who are about to die, not even the little man himself. I bring myself back to now by screaming, gagging on the choke of cordite and coppery blood, and find my wife is hurt. From a chair across the room, she says, Dave, it's okay. But you see, it'll never be okay. That little man will make his run in my head as I helplessly watch, and neither time nor her tears will make him stop. It is not my fault I couldn't stop him. I know that. I've always known that. But now she thinks it's her fault because she can't stop him. Thank you, David. It's, you know, it, it is really... It, it's um, it's really painful and great at the same time to listen and hear and hear what you say and yeah and you know and I was thinking about Rachel and both of you were writing about um, you know Rachel's job was you know at that time was was kicking down doors am I right? Well, we were replacing the ones who were yeah. going to do yeah. essentially the yeah searches and yeah. raids. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to go to Sang. Ask Sang, would you would you tell something about your unique experience? Sure. Um, I don't really have any heroic stories or anything, um, but I think I can tell a, a good, a very unique experience that you know, during my deployment, I think it um, brings a lot of laughter between me and my friend um, uh, Rogers, who was there with me when, when this happened. Um, but so our platoon was. Um, Flying on these Chinooks, and we were, go to, we were going to like this small um, outpost. So we're uh, like sitting down there and just relieve the, yeah, the unit that was there. Um, so it was also a secondary mission for, for the medics, me and Rogers, um, where we were training the, uh, the Afghan medics there. So part of the prep was that we're going to bring all these books and notebooks for 10 of them. So we actually brought like 80. Like we were just bringing so much more material than needed. So on the Chinook, I had my um, rucksack, assault pack, a bag, and two boxes. So, and, so this is just to clarify, because Rogers likes to think that he knows what happened that night, but I'll set the uh, this scene straight and show him the video. But uh, so, we, so everybody, um, so we landed, and the objective is to you know, run out the Chinook. The problem was that it's, very, it's dark, it, it was like 11 p.m. So we had MVGs on, or night vision goggles. So we, we got up, and so here was, this, this is how I was like situated. Well, I was just standing up, and I had like a box stacked in front of my A bag that was in front of me, and this other box was like on the floor, and I had to make a decision to get this box out, and everybody's gonna go out. So what I did was I, I literally kicked the box out. Um, so towards the, at the end of the entrance, um, the, actual, the box actually ripped. So all the notebooks, like 80 something notebooks was like just like, Blocking the, um, the, the or, or the, the the exit. So what what I did was I, I literally got down and like started picking them up, and then from from behind I can still see people like running, and then it was just like 
Welcome back. It's, it's very funny. And then Rogers, he, he, he's the hero of the day. So he came and started to help me uh, pick all, all, all these notebooks up. And from like the whole time we were there on that, um, on that little base, he was just giving me so much um, a hard time, really. And we were just having like a blast. And he was like, oh, why did you, you know, you're supposed to get off. You know, you, you know what's the mission. You know, what, you know what you have to do when you leave at Chinook. And it was just, uh, so that was, that's my unique experience. It's very funny. It's very like, this is something that can only happen to me and my luck, you know. Right. So <laughs> that's it. Thank you, son. I, I'm, I'm not, I, have, I actually, I don't have a watch with me. My phone is over my briefcase. So I don't know what time it is, but I have an interval clock saying we should move on to Mark. All right, so but, would you, Mark? Okay. And then we'll do a little wrap up in this way. Okay. Okay, so it's just helpful to know that the, uh, the intensity of your experience in Vietnam, in my opinion, was based on the year you were there, uh, the unit you, uh, that you were with, and the job that you did. So that if you were, a, for example, an infantry uh, forward observer, in other words, you're out on a patrol, but you were the guy that called in the artillery rounds. Some say you had a lifespan of less than a minute. You know, those guys went kind of quick. Uh, in any event, the year I was there, uh, I saw my sh it was not a, a year of big battles. So instead, I saw my share of uh, firefights and the occasional rocket and mortar attack. I was on a base that was overrun. That was a, a bad night. Uh, uh, the story I want to tell is what I think is uh, one of, it, it's a, it's a non-war war story. So I'd seen my share of combat. I did eight months in the infantry as a medic. Should have done only six. That was the, the policy in the first cab. So I was back on a rear base, and I, I had a, a menial job. And I was ordered to go back out to the, infant, to the jungle f to be a medic for another company because the medic was, was down. He was either wounded or killed. And I refused. I just instinctively refused. It wasn't my company. I didn't know these guys. And I had done my time. So first a sergeant, and then a lieutenant, and then a captain. And finally, a, uh, I think a major came over to me. And, you got to go. This is a direct order. You got to go. So I uh, had to scarf up my gear, helmet, ammo, sea rations, water, M16, put everything in my pack. And uh, I walked out to this chopper pad. And I, was, I didn't realize it, but I was melting down. I was getting kind of angry. And uh, this chopper comes in you know, 10 minutes later. And they're hustling me, hustling me on, you know, get on. And I just said, uh, no, no. I knew what was going down. There was a lieutenant back in the rear, and he, want, he was the one who gave the order. He didn't like me, and uh, I didn't care for him. I didn't get along with the guys back in the rear. I figured it was him that gave the order. So I brushed these uh, two warrant officers off in, in a chopper. I just said, no. And they, they looked at me strange, and then this chopper just lifted up and went away. That was the chopper that was going to take me out to the jungle. And then just by chance, 10 minutes later, this other chopper comes in. I don't know what they were about, but I said to them, are you going back to the rear? And they said, yes, and I hopped on board. <laughs> I'm locked and loaded. I got an M16, I got three bandoliers, I got a 50-pound or whatever pound rucksack with food and, and water. And I'm, uh, I'm not just angry, I'm enraged, but I'm not thinking, I'm just feeling that. So it's about, a, I don't know, let's say it's a 15 minute flight to this place called Phuc Vinh, big large base, where the battalion aid station was. And uh, it's about, let's say, a half mile walk from the chopper pad to where the battalion aid station was, where the medics were and the lieutenant who gave the order. And uh, I'm walking, and I'm walking, and I'm angry, and I'm locked and loaded. And I finally turn this bend, and there's the lieutenant just coming out of the aid station. I see him from, let's say, 40 or 50 yards. And I start walking toward him. Step by step, my M16 by itself just kind of raises up and levels itself to his chest. And as I near him, I start to curse him out, and I'm cursing, I'll spare you, but I'm cursing him out. And in between the curses, I'm saying, are you sending me out? 
and I curse him. Are you sending me out? And then I'm within about from here to here, and he slowly raises his hands like this, and he finally he says, uh, you don't have to go. It was a mistake. I'll send someone else. And I, I, I walked past him. I just walked right past him, and I walked into the aid station and found an empty bunk, and I threw down my pack, and I took off my helmet, and I took off my ammo, and I lay down my weapon, and I cried. And that guy, that lieutenant, never bothered me again. He could have, but I, for whatever reason, he chose not to. And about 25 years later, I was out in a cornfield with my radio man, uh, and I told him that story, because he didn't know about it. He'd been wounded. And he looked at me, and he said, uh, Jesus Christ, Doc, that's what the medics are called, I bet he thought you were going to kill him. And I said, I never thought of that. <laughs> that's how, that's how, that's what was going on. I wasn't thinking, it was just all raw emotion. Thank you, Mark, thank you. And also thank you for giving us a kind of category of understanding all four stories, the non-war war story, right? Because, you know, even David's, you know, recollection, the poem ends up at home you know, that many years later, you know, and, and we some, all made it. yeah, well, that's true, right? There it is. Um, all right. Well, it's, it's right now about 10 after four. I, I, I was donated a watch, so we're going to, we're going to be okay. Um, let's, let's go to part three, you know, coming home. All right. Oh, before we do that, there's one thing I wanted to ask about this moment. How old, how old were you then, Mark, that in your story? <coughs> Uh, I was 20 when, I, yeah. when that story took place. Okay, and Sung? Uh, 20. Yeah, David? I was 17 when yeah. I joined 20. My 20th birthday, I was hit in Vietnam. Mm. Um, I had just turned 21. Right. I mean, it's just important, isn't it, to remember that fact. We were that, children. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, children with, with these, these concerns, you know, and even though sometimes it you know, could be absurdly hilarious, right? It never is, ultimately. It's more absurd than hilarious in the end, and especially when you're 20 years old. Some things are funny. Yeah. But, but the humor is GI humor. It's so black. Yeah. It's so dark, you know, that civilians don't get a whole lot of it. So, you know, we laugh at it, and they look at us like we're crazy. Uh, but... We we we're this way for a reason, so. Thanks, David. Want to want to go home? Yeah, let's go home. All right. So, Rachel, when when what happened and how did you get back and you know what was it like and how did it feel when you got back? Ah, it was super weird. I mean, because like I said, you know, around that time that all that happened, it was nearing the end of the deployment. We started sort of taking our casualties and. Um, our replacements came in and we had to train them and uh, they were you know accepting volunteers to stay and to fill some of the other units um, my platoon sergeant um, who really didn't oversee me since I was on this other team um, said that you know he wasn't really interested in me staying um, that nobody had slots for women like played the whole thing which is probably smart I, I'm not really sure what I was going on in my mind that I wanted to stay in that situation. Um, shortly after that was the Battle of Ramadi, so it was sort of like the, um, I, just this like eerie sense, you know, kind of driving and leaving, like it just felt um, like, we, you know, we should all be staying and not just sending some like newbies into this storm. Um, but then I came home and uh, within eight days of landing in the US, I was back in Wisconsin. Um, we had left the base, you know, done our, regrouping and then, you know, had a few months before we had to report back to the reserve unit. Um, within a few weeks, I remember going down to uh, Ohio, which is where a lot of the people from my unit were from, for one of my friend's 21st birthdays. I had been my um, peer on my gun truck crew, which was like um, three people plus a medic. So it was his birthday and I remember going out and uh, 
someone punched him before any of us were drinking. Like I hadn't had a single thing to drink and um, it's like my first sign that something significant had changed was that uh, once this guy punched him without thinking, I punched this guy that punched my friend in face, like no thought process was like, well, I'm not a conscientious objector or like whatever, but like I just sort of automatically just went after this guy and uh, then just walked out. Uh, <laughs> the bar owners were like, hey, we got that on video if you wanna like call the police. And I was like, no, we better just head out. <laughs> so uh, I, you know, kind of realized that, that it was like, you know, there's some sort of shift. Uh, and uh, I think that was, you know, I was 21, um, so it was like really kind of hard to make sense of, you know, but looking back, that was probably my first sign. Um, and then, you know, I think I alluded a little bit to like when I then went to the VA shortly thereafter, I think by like four months later after returning, then they were like, oh, you're fine, like it's just, you know, you just need to stop imagining these other people's experiences um, kind of thing. and. And that was also like enraging, but um, at the same time, I think it ended up kind of like putting me on a particular path where um, I didn't expect that the war would still be on right now, I'm 35, um, but I have been uh, basically uh, doing whatever I can to lessen the damage um, kind of ever since then um, while you know, trying to kind of work through everything that happened. Um, but I was in the military ultimately until 2010, uh, and it was uh, like I'd had some line of duty determinations for stuff from overseas, but it sort of took that amount of time for them to ultimately medically retire me um, for like an autoimmune thing that I developed, probably mm -hmm. from working in the burn pit. Um, but that was like sort of another shocker where I was, you know, expecting to stay in the military um, and to, you know, continue on. I was kind of rising, I was promoted ahead of my peers. Uh, I was, you know, a mentor for a lot of the younger soldiers. Um, but it was really hard to process. One of, you know, one of the kids that I had graduated from high school with, one of the five that enlisted, um, ended up killing himself. Um, not too much longer after I came back, after he did his uh, stint with the Marines. Um, and then a lot of the friends that I had served with started having issues, um, you know, one of the guys that had a traumatic brain injury tried to kill his entire family. Um, another one was in prison for seven years for armed robbery. Um, you know, you just kind of start to see things playing out with everyone, um, which, you know, sort of facilitated, again, my, um, a lot of the work that I do um, and kind of recognizing this, this gap that was there for, for at least like the first few, you know, rounds of veterans coming home, I think. Um, before they started to put more things in place. But um, I really um, became active with um, Iraq veterans against the war while I was still in the military, um, you know, trying to kind of understand moral injury and, you know, mm -hmm. what it was that I was seeing that, that was happening um, with myself and my friends. Um, and, uh, you know, trying to just kind of have an impact however I could, um, even though it's, you know, not not really possible for one person to stop any of it. Thank you, Rachel. And, and let me just say thank you also for, for, for following the trail of your own thought just then to, to that, that dimension of moral injury and, and the, the you know, I don't know how to put this, and I don't want to impose my language on your experience, but so correct it where it goes off, but you know, that there was some evolution. You did change over the course of those years in the military. And part of the change had something to do with a, with a, a more critical assessment of what, what the hell this was. And what and wasn't just that, you know, the rage of, or wasn't just the accidental rage of punching that guy out, you know, that, that it was, that was just, you know, a, a visual dimension of it. David, would you, would you pick up the moral injury aspect of it? Absolutely, the, it's, you know, it, I, I've been asked you know, the last time Rachel and I were at Soap Boston High School, I was asked if, if I was still a Christian. And I was like, no, I was God when I was 18. I decided who lived and died. There's no more God for me. There's no more God for me. It, it just, I was raised a Roman Catholic, and I just, none of it. None of it. Yeah. First time I came home, I come off an ambush patrol at first light. 
And, uh, and within 24 hours, literally on the same day I killed people in Vietnam, I was in Logan Airport, having crossed the international date line. Uh, I get in the cab and uh, gave the cab driver my home address, 153 I Street, and he said, now we're going somewhere else. And he took me to a bar in Maverick Square and got me shit-faced, and, you know? Uh, and uh, he wanted to show me where he had Chinese mortar fragments in the left cheek of his behind, and I said, no, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. I, be I believe you, I'm good. Uh, nobody asked me how old I was. You know, I was only 18, but I was a sergeant of infantry with three rows of battle ribbons and a combat infantry badge. Nobody asked me shit. Uh, when he dropped me at my dad's house, he said to me, uh, be nice to them and they don't know what's coming in the door. Not who's coming in the door, what's coming in the door. Uh, but when I come in, they were afraid of me. Uh, we had already become demonized in the press as, as uh, walking time bombs and drug crazed baby killers and bullshit like that. And I was only home seven days and went down to the, to the Boston Army base and said, if, if I can go back to the 11th Cav, I'll go back to Nam. And they were like, used car salesmen. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. And I found myself back in Vietnam, and because I didn't belong here, I still don't belong here. Um, you know, the people sitting on this panel, we're outside this society, and it will always be. Uh, the next time I come home, I come home wounded and have a series of hospitals, and, but I gotta tell you, that I got hit with a guy who, his nickname was Pooh Bear, and every time I woke up in a, a different hospital or uh, the hospital ship sanctuary, Pooh Bear was beside me. You know, and, and I'd ask, how's he doing? How am I doing? You know? uh, and when I landed in Japan, a, a captain, a nurse, patted me on the face and she said, you're going home with all the parts that matter. I said, great. Uh, and I looked over and there was Pooh Bear. And I reached over when she walked away and threw the sheet over his face and the next person by wheeled him away to the morgue where he woke up 20 minutes later and scared the piss out of the kid that was, <laughs> that was working there. Uh, he still doesn't think it's funny. He calls me motherfucker over it, you know? Uh, but within five days of being back in the States, I was taken into custody for the first time for protests in the war I had just fought in uniform I still had a drain in my abdomen, but the MPs beat the piss out of me anyway, you know? And I've been fighting against war as foreign policy uh, since then, you know? My dad used to say when he'd come and pick me up at Station 6 or uh, wherever, you know, uh, can't you just go fucking bowling? I was like, no, I can't, Dad. You taught me to stand up for what I believe in. That's how I ended up in Vietnam. That's why you're picking me up after being arrested again. And no, I just can't go fucking bold. I have to do what I was taught to do. Uh, I thought I was a tough kid from South Boston, uh, and I could handle it all. And But uh, the second time I got hit, the RPG that got my arm and went, peace went through my face. It was a young lady that got me, a young Viet Cong woman. I looked her right in the eye before she touched that fucking RPG off. So, you know, I wasn't as tough as I thought I was. <laughs> so. and thank you, David. Thank you. I mean, uh, Sang, I wanted to ask you that, that and we we're, we're following a through line. You don't have to stick with it, but I'm curious, does that phrase moral injury have uh, any resonance for you? Moral injury. Uh, can you re elaborate on that again? I just want to make sure. If, if, if. It's a moral injury. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can think about it. For me, it was um, this, this sort of sense of violation of 
um, some deeply held beliefs I had, um, and uh, in unexpected ways that um, lingers. It was how you were raised, how, uh, if you were raised in a religion, how did your service conflict with how you were raised? What, what happened that, that changed your idea of a greater being? Okay. To so, start with. Yeah, so moral injury. So for me, uh, I, I don't feel nothing, anything was challenged, um, just from based, based from my experience. Uh, for, to me, for me to generalize, I, I did my best. I did my job. I took care uh, to those left and my right. Um, um, I've, I've never felt like I was in a uh, situation where my morals were challenged, um, and I'm very thankful for that. Uh, but yeah, you know, let me just let's just stay with it for a minute longer, okay? This is where politics and history come into play, right? And one of the differences, maybe, and this may be your experience, you can confirm or, or you know, ch challenge, but, but it may be that, that the, the moral context of the Vietnam War, you know, was very different from how folks felt enlisting or, you know, going into Iraq or Afghanistan uh, after 9-11, that, that this, the, the, one of the things that's pretty clear is that, is that, that when, when, when one loses the sense that this is right, then suddenly you know, you're on the edge of doing wrong. And there's that great sense that somehow or another you're complicit in, in something really that you don't believe in. And that sense of betrayal occurs. I think that's what Rachel was getting at at her end. And this doesn't necessarily have to be the case. In, every, in fact, one of the things I hope comes out of this conversation is that these are really unique stories and you're a unique individual. And so you don't have to have a moral injury. To, you know, it's, not on, it's not required. On the other hand, it's worth investigating and thinking about. Um, so I'll say this, just to elaborate on my, my experience. So my, my, what my job was that I was there to train, advise, and assist the Afghan army. Um, and also provide medical support to my to, to the unit there. Um, now, those ex the experience that you know the the, the, the infantrymen that they, they have, they could probably you know answer this. But for me, I felt like you know I took I took care of them. I, I took care. I did my job to the best of my ability. Um, I believe what our, our mission there. We helped the Afghan army. We we made um, significant I believe significant process into their training. Um, and we hope to, you know, so that at that time it was 2014, and the conflict's still today. So I hope that my what 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 we've done, we we help them from 2014 till now. So hopefully, you know, we, we develop them to be better war fighters, and and just to be 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 able to better take care to to hand over the country when that time comes. So. And as a combat medic, you no doubt help people. Yeah, hopefully they, you know, All right. All right. it's kind of, right. it's kind of really funny. I really think about this is that for me to do my job, something bad has to happen. Yeah. And so for, for me, I would rather have nothing bad happen. So I always, you know, pray for that. Um, but obviously reality um, is ugly. So great. You know. Thank you. Mark, you want to follow that theme a little bit? Okay. Um, so you have to imagine that the ambush is over and the survivors have been finished off uh, except for this one girl who's uh, she's already been claymored and then she got machine gunned and uh, we surrounded her and she was she'd been uh, hanging on all night so she was dehydrated and uh, her legs were broken, and there's 20 GIs surrounding her. And I walk over to her, and she reaches up and she starts pawing at my canteen. So the first thing I did was uh, splint her legs with rotten bamboo, because that's all that we had. And then she, she's clawing, her hands are like claws, she's clawing in my canteen. And there I am, I'm 20 years old, and I don't know what to do. I'm thinking, in terms of moral injury, my thoughts, my perception, my way of processing this was, if I give her my canteen, 
That's a quart of water that's going to be contaminated. I'll never touch that canteen again. I'm going to be down a quart of water. I'm also thinking, a platoon is looking at me. What do I do? So I hemmed and I hawed, and it, this was not a moral decision. This was not a rational decision. I just uh, so I went with uh, a non cognitive there was no no cognition here. I just gave her the fucking canteen, and she just glugged it down. And, and, and she's glugging it down. I thought, well, that, that's that. I'm never going to touch that thing again. Because she was an other. She was a bug. She was non-human. She was a thing. That's the way I thought of her. That's the way we thought of these people. And then a chopper came and a medevac came and airlifted her out. And later on we found out that she was in the lead element of a, maybe 100 NVA that were coming. But uh, whether she lived or died, I don't know. The, the, uh, the end of the story is that you fast forward to uh, 1998 or so, and I meet Bao Nin, who some of you may know about. He wrote The Sorrow of War, NVA veteran of uh, 500 people in his unit, 90% were wiped out over a period of seven years. And I met him just by uh, incredible coincidence, and Fred may have been there at the time. It was very emotional, very, very emotional. And I interviewed him the next day for about uh, t t two or three hours through uh, a Vietnamese interpreter. And it was then that I had this sort of breakthrough. And uh, finally saw the Vietnamese as human beings. It, it took a while. Thank you, Mark. Mark has written beautifully about his meeting with Bao Ning. I should add that. Okay, I'm going to stand up now because I'm going to shift gears toward you. Yeah, it's 4.30? Oh, good. Well, let me just do a little English teacher riff here, okay? Now, thank you. I, I wasn't looking at you folks at all, and I, I could just tell how silent everything was that you were listening as hard as you could. And, and I just want to say that the etymology of the word listen is a really important etymology. For those of you who drink a lot, you may know that you, you get drunk, you could list towards this way or that. But when you're listening, you're really leaning in to hear and listening in the direction of the person who's speaking. And honestly, I think that is really one of the great gifts that you as an audience could give to those who just told their stories. And so I want to say thank you for those. I'm going to turn to the audience now, and all of a sudden Mitch Manning has his hand up. And so but anyone who wants to ask a question, please, um, you know, or make an observation. It doesn't have to be a question. But in response to what we've been talking about, um, um, I'm sure that we'd all be grateful. Mitch, you want this microphone? All right. Uh, thank you guys so much. I'm really, really grateful for your stories. And I wonder, Rachel and uh, Dave and Mark, if you guys could just elaborate a little bit on the IBAW and PBAW. And I'm interested in the camaraderie side of the other veterans that you work with on those uh, campaigns. And you know, Dave, you kind of outlined a little bit of what you went through, both personally and legally, for you know, protesting against the war. But I'm just really curious about. Um, you know how it came together amongst other veterans, because I think the show gives us a sense of uh, of the movement, and I'm really interested, uh, Rachel, in your work as well with IBW, you know, knowing the history of Winter Soldier, and it's just you know for folks who didn't serve, it's something I'm really interested. In. Just wonder if you can elaborate, and saw you as well, if folks who you served with were also sort of part of these conversations too. Well, the first time I met Rachel, I was asked by a. A, a mutual friend of ours, Apana Lakshmi, who's a Boston high school teacher, would I come up to Southie High and speak in her class? And I did. And then the next time she asked me to come up, she said, there's a Iraq vet that wants to come up and speak with you. And I said, sure. And I walked in, there's Rachel. And she said, you have a problem? And I said, this is my sister. This is my sister, all right? And she's like, really? And I said, yeah, I don't know her at all but she's my sister, all right? Especially if she's gonna stand up here and talk about anti-war, you know? About what happened to her in the military. Uh, and, you know, terrible things happen to women in the military. And, and they're mostly, uh, they're mostly unspoken about. 
Uh, it, when we went up there, I asked her to speak about military sexual assault, and a young man in the class said, women soldiers were raped by the Iraqis? And I said, no, by American soldiers. Mostly, they're superiors, and these kids were shocked. They were sh but there's the, there's the bottom line. That's what happens, and it happens too much. Uh, and if, you know, uh, there's, there, and there's no way around it. You, you put, but I'm not just talking about women either. You know, in, in the Navy, there's rampant sexual abuse, and it's men on men. It's not just men on women. So uh, it's, uh, it's a fact of life. And if you're going to join the military, you better be aware of the fact that you are prey. Prey. So. <laughs> so uh, it was in 2006, 2007, um, it wasn't, you know, there wasn't like an open movement. I mean, it was, um, I was a reservist, so I had a little bit more liberty. And I think I sort of inadvertently came across veterans that um, there had been on the anniversary of the invasion, um, not long after I came home. It could have actually been right away in maybe March 2006 um, that I was in Madison and there was a march or something going on that I wasn't really expecting to encounter. And sort of at the heart of it, there was um, just this small group of people wearing desert fatigues. And, you know, I was like, I recognize that. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, I kind of like, it was on the edges a little bit, but, um, you know, I talked to them. And um, that was sort of my link to other people who um, were meeting up and kind of starting to talk about the war. Uh, there were some journalists that were, would come around. Um, Aaron Glantz uh, wrote, wrote a, a book called Washington's Battle Against Ameri America's Veterans um, that was kind of dealing with some of the issues we were facing at the VA, uh, whether it was like diagnosis of traumatic brain injury, sort of all the things that there was a, kind of initially a denial of you know, the gravity of it. So um, my focus with the organizing with that group was you know, really bringing that kind of information and organizing events where people like him would come and speak. Um, I would share things with my leadership. Uh, with Tyler Bedreau is actually a writer from the Northeast who wrote a book called Packing Inferno, The Un Making of a Marine, and I really connected with that. And um, you know, he was starting to write a lot about moral injury, and I'll just like leave this, these, the literature for my um, leadership because you know they were having to deal with it because our unit um, had become sort of they called it the 826 organ donors instead of ordnance company because we were just sort of sent off with these other units and then came back and then the leadership had to deal with this, um, really what they didn't have any idea what, what any of us did, uh, trying to reform our unit. Um, so that was kind of the, the entryway. We started to organize for a, a winter soldier. Um, and I mean, I was still in and uh, there was, you know, um, not support you know, across the board. A lot of my leadership did support me speaking. I testified to the Senate Democratic Policy Committee um, about Halliburton. I, I didn't know this was a kind of scary thing to do <laughs> until I uh, arrived in front of the members of Congress. And they told me that it was, since I was still in. But you know, there was some support. But also, kind of if you spoke out, um, I had something to stand on. People did know what my experiences were, and um, most of the people in my unit didn't have the same experiences. But um, there, there were also, you know, sort of questions, and you know, I always had these kind of suspicions, like, it, you know, is this why, like, my medical board takes so long, or like, you know, like, kind of trying to understand what um, what was going on there, what that dynamic was about, um, but also, you know, there there were a lot of things going on. Um, that, that I was dealing with anyway. Um, and it was really after I left the military, I think, that I you know, kind of sought out more um, people with shared experiences and uh, really got connected to you know, a lot more Vietnam veterans than I had been exposed to in Madison because I was still in, so I wasn't as active as I might otherwise have been um, in the groups. Um, but it's, you know, it really was helpful to see, you know, that this is a, actually a clear path. Um, it's, uh, you know, in some ways it's 
it was hard for me because I didn't um, enlist with some idea, you know, that I, I wanted to be there. Uh, one of the more compelling things that happened, I think, that really pushed me into the military was this sort of sense of terror I had when this woman was like, this very nice woman, was like, um, we should just turn the Middle East into a sheet of glass. And I remember just being like, why on earth would we drop a nuclear weapon and kill a bunch of innocent people? Like, this is just not a logical thought process, but it was, what was, I think, terrifying for me was that it was like, just so casual. And I felt like, you know, that's, we've been here before, or the other people have been here before. Um, but I, um, what I found when I went into the anti-war movement is a lot of people were sort of surprised. You know, they were recruited, they, they didn't recruit themselves, uh, and so there, were, there was a little bit of a difference there where I didn't find a lot of people that I could connect to on, you know, kind of that level. Uh, but that was my own, you know, decision-making process that um, wasn't logical. Uh, there were probably different ways I could have approached it than just throwing myself into the middle of a combat zone. But, yeah, that was, uh, you know, it was still, it was still important, um, you know, to make some of those connections and transitioning and figuring out, you know, now what am I going to do with my life? Um, I haven't figured it out yet. I, I didn't expect, you know, like I said, the war to still be going on. And sort of as long as it is, I think I'll be in this kind of work. Um, so maybe I'll do that for the rest of my life. But it was really huge to have that support in transition. This gentleman, I'm going to give you the microphone. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm curious about um, what. Thank you. Yeah, I'm curious about GI's attitudes toward the war when you were in. I know the. I know you all were just trying to survive, especially you know Vietnam and, and in Iraq. Um, but you know, as we we saw, there was a ton of GI resistance. Uh, the, the army has mutinies, and and you know, Long Bin Jail was burned down and stuff like that. So I'm wondering if you if you guys saw any of that, because um, I know I was in the army in '70 70, '72 in Germany mostly. I was not a Vietnam veteran. And everybody was against the war. It was like, and the black guys, they all had posters of Malcolm X and Eldridge Cleaver and stuff in their barracks. So I'd like to hear something about, about that. Well, I, the, you know, very, very early in the war, bef we realized that the only, by and large, the only Vietnamese who were willing to fight the war were on the other side. Uh, uh, the, the, our allies were very willing to let us stand up and die. Uh, uh, at, at dusk, they'd retreat, retreat behind the wire and leave us out to fight the communists. And, uh, and you know, I made it kind of a joke about dying high, die high. You know, if you're going to die, die high. And, but there were there were times where, you know, the, We'd be, we'd approach a trail junction and the lieutenant would say, Conley, you're up. Like, I'm supposed to walk down that trail. And I knew it was alive with fucking death, you know? Uh, and I'd say, no, walk around it. Call in TAC Air, call in Adi, you know? Artillery, excuse me, Adi. Uh, like you're supposed to know <coughs> nomenclature. But it's like, I'm not walking down there. What are you going to do if I don't? Send me to Vietnam. <laughs> Put me in the infantry. What are you going to do if I don't? Uh, and, and if he pushed, there was a real chance he'd be bagged before the morning came. OK? If he got people killed by pushing, the chance got greater that he'd be the next one dead. Uh, that's what happened. Uh, the longer the war went on, the more fraggings happened, the more insurrection happened. And they were little insurrections. You know, I was on radio watch one night, and I, a guy come on the battalion net, uh, and he said, A Company, 4th of the 12th, which was 199th Light Infantry Brigade, our, our leg unit. I was armored cavalry, but we had infantry too. But he said, A Company, 4th of the 12th, just told their company commander, fuck you, we're not fighting and the whole company sat down. What are they going to do? Put the whole company in Long Bend? I was in Long Bend for 10 days, you know? And Long Bend, you know, Long Bend, every meal you got a tune-up. And the black MPs 
would tune up the white GIs and the white MPs would tune up the black GIs so it was fair, you know? But it was better than doing stupid shit and getting killed for what ultimately come down to nothing. We killed three million Indo-Chinese, three million at least, you know? Uh, we had 58,000 plus killed, 100,000 plus have killed themselves since coming home, 380,000 wounded. I'm still dealing with my wounds 50 years down the line, you know? It come down to nothing. But people in the bush, they knew that right from the get-go, that we were not going to win this thing. We were not going to win it. So There was nothing to win. So I can elaborate uh, from, from my um, uh, deployment to, to Afghanistan. Uh, so the people there, uh, and I truly believe this, everybody was there because we believed in the mission. We wanted to be there. To the, having that mindset of protesting was never in anybody's thought process. We wanted to do our job um, and, and do it well. Um, I've, I don't know, it's really, um, when, you, when you ask, Pose that question, sir. It was very surprising. I was like, "Wow, nobody really like thought about like uh, going against uh, uh, going against the Afghanistan war while we were there. It's, it's just preposterous." So it's just yeah. So there was n none of that thinking there, f just from my experience and perspective. That's yeah. the difference between the wars. Yeah, that's you know. And uh, yeah, and I would sort of second that. I mean, um, ultimately, I mean, you you volunteer and you you know I volunteered with the intention of being sent and being able to kind of sort things out. And um, sure, morale was horrible. There was nobody that was like, geez, I really know what the mission is. Like, nobody knew what was going on or what we were doing in Iraq. There, were, there was no, you know, goal or mission to be opposed to. It was more or less what we were opposed to was, like, the wasting our time. Um, you know, our kind of resistance was, like, you know, me opening up a Connex and finding a bunch of empty water bottles and like chewing out a person who is much higher ranking than me for sending us on this pointless, dangerous mission. Um, you know, like things that were like things that didn't add up contributed to the erosion of morale, but part of that was because there was no um, clear goal at that point. And maybe there was for the sort of crew that invaded, but once it shifted into sort of a parallel insurgency with um, the civil conflict emerging, we were kind of driving a wedge in. It was uh, really hard to make sense of what, what what was going on. And so I think that that was more of the issue. Um, and then the other piece of it was with, with reservists, more people I think, you know, had families and other jobs and professions. Um, it wasn't, you know, our full-time kind of gig. So we uh, had a lot of people who would not refuse to go on missions, but who were terrified. And then the rest of us with no kids just volunteered. Um, but it was, you know, any of the kind of resistance wasn't directed at, like, you know, kind of protesting the war in the ranks. It was um, survival, I guess. You know, my problem is my first order getting off that plane on 2 February 68 was kill every you see. And I was like, wait a minute, we're just here to kill people? How the fuck can that be right? You know, that's the aim. That's the aim. But my dad was in World War II, and every step he took towards Germany left free people behind him. You know? That's what I thought I was walking into. Instead, it was just open season on. And I was like, this cannot be right. We're going to lose this war. My, one of my first thoughts landing on 2 February 68, we're going to lose this war. And we fucking well did. <laughs> That's a tough act to follow. And I was kind of at the other end of the spectrum when I got there. Uh, but somehow, uh, on a dusty little fire base in, in Ann Lock, I got a copy of the Berkeley Barb. Hmm. Uh, so if any of you were, saw the, uh, the exhibit yesterday, I don't know if the Barb was there, but there's all these anti-war papers. So the Berkeley Barb was a great read, but I was uh, politically naive. And I was uh, rooted in just the immediate experience. So I'm reading about protest, and I'm this 
these really cool graphics and this out, these outrageous texts. But what value do they have for us right there? And what would come to my mind, I remember this very clearly, this fantasy of taking a company of GIs and putting them in a baseball field with a company of protesters. And what would happen? Would they rail at each other or would they come over to us because we needed reinforcements? That, that's where I was at. On the other hand, some of the most uh, politically informed um, soldiers I encountered in my unit was black guys. It was a black power movement in Vietnam. They would wear these uh, black crosses made out of shoelaces and black armbands and do this thing called the DAP and occasionally got uh, violent and militant. It's not well known. It's not talked about too much in the histories. People died because of things got out of hand. But the black soldiers were basically saying, this is not our war. This is a white man's war. And, and uh, it took me a while to, to uh, understand that uh, they were really m much more aware of the, of, the, uh, of the dynamic of what was taking place. Even if it was just a simple, simplified version of the arcane politics. This wasn't their war. It was a war that, like Dave said, it was over before it began. You know, one of the, one of the first prisoners I took was a wounded uh, Viet Cong who turned out to be a captain. And he spoke in perfect English to the, my brother, the black GI who was with me. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? You're not even a citizen in your own country. In perfect English, he said that. Meanwhile, we couldn't speak a, speak a lick of Vietnamese. They made sure we had no idea what we were walking into. We had no idea of the culture, the history. I was the only person in my infantry school that knew that the French had fought there before us. The only one. And, and my DI told me I was full of shit. And I said, go find an encyclopedia, look up Vietnam. And, and he come back two days later and he said, Jesus, you're right. <laughs> uh, a great, great panel. Thank you very much for having this. This is a wonderful uh, experience just talking about this issue because nobody talks about it. I've been out in the street 18 years giving out flyers against the war. People been calling me a, uh, uh, terrorist lover and snowballs were thrown at us in 2001, 2002, 2003. I'd go to Fenway Park. This is the first year no one said, USA, USA, bomb, bomb uh, Afghanistan to the Stone Age. No one talks about that. It's just astounding how many people come up to me from foreign countries and say, I've been here for six weeks. No one has mentioned the Afghanistan war or the uh, Iraq war. This is the first time I've seen any protests at all. In fact, I was there in uh, 71, 72 when Mark's story was exactly what happened. We had wall lockers and, and surprise inspections to make sure we didn't have any weapons because the officers were afraid and we would frag them. Absolutely. It's unbelievable to think about that. Another thing is my job in Vietnam was to detox American soldiers from heroin. Heroin. There was so much heroin in Vietnam, they were flying home, detoxing on the planes. They had to take a urine test to leave Vietnam. One they, step away They were from reopening hospitals that had been set up for wounded, combat wounded. They were reopening hospitals to put junkies in them right. to detox so that they could pass a piss test to come back come to back. the States. But can you Am imagine lying, one, Joe? <laughs> one step away from getting on the plane, you wind up in an opiate in your urine you're staying in Nam. That's right. Can you imagine thinking and not knowing how long you're going to be in there? This is just unbelievable to think. You know, m most Americans don't know about the fraggings. They don't know about the uh, heroin addiction. And I was out protesting the war. You know what the people said to me? If it wasn't for the politicians, Vietnam, we would have won the war. When we killed the last right. Vietnamese, Vietnamese, that's what, how but, we would have won. There was no way we were beating those people. 
Right. Well, I have a, a one last story to tell you. A group of Vietnam veterans, we went out to Kazakhstan in 1988. We met the Soviet soldiers who fought in Afghanistan. They were telling us the same story we were telling them. The difference was, as a uh, soldier in Vietnam, I went over to replace another soldier coming back. They went over from cities like um, uh, Moscow. Uh, groups of them would go over and then come back. So they had some sort of uh, uh, support system when they came back. But the sad part, they would see the mothers of their fellow comrades who didn't come back. But I said to myself, in 1988, we will never go to Afghanistan. How could we? We're going to do the same thing all over again. We've been there 18 years. And the most incredible story of all is Ron Paul, who said, pull out. The Republicans kicked him out of Congress. Dennis Kucinich, a Democrat, said, end the wars. Well, who did the Democrats do? They kicked him out. So we're just wrapped into this military industrial complex that is crushing the American dream as well as thinking I went to college in the 60s for 100 bucks a semester. $100 a semester, 500,000 soldiers in Vietnam. 500,000 soldiers, and that what didn't count the first fleet, the second fleet, the third fleet, or whatever, and all these other soldiers around. It was still cheap. Now, you go see the cost of education today. Half my money goes into the, and tax money goes to the military, 5% for education, and 1% for transportation. This is, and I, I can see a point, everybody was for, uh, in the Iraq war was for the mission, but there's a, a, a disconnect with the rest of the people. The rest of the people in the country think it's bogus. They know it's a lost cause. Everybody knows it's a lost cause, and we're still sending soldiers over there. I couldn't imagine, one tour in Vietnam is enough for me, but I couldn't imagine these soldiers today going four, five, six, seven tours. And you know something, Joe? It's unbelievable. The bo there's boys coming home right now, and young men and women coming home right now, whose fathers fought the same fucking war. It's gone on that long. So. <laughs> Folks, it's five o'clock, and um, I'm gonna ask your indulgence with two things. First, I would really like it to, for us all to give our panelists a heartfelt round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. And I, the other indulgence is to end on a poem. This one by another Vietnamese poet, a contemporary named Vo Quê. And he's a friend, and he's a friend of the Joyner Institute. And he swore that this poem is a love poem. But I know deep down inside, this is a poem about the war. It's called The Peach. Let me glasses on. Let me hold it over here, yeah. Fred, so you can see it. No. <laughs> the Peach by Vo Quê. Overnight, a bat has eaten half the peach. The rest has fallen onto the sad, sad earth. For you, I leave a portion of happiness. Me, I shall keep my share of the sorrow. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for coming. There's still food over here, so please eat, drink some tea, talk to someone if you haven't, and, um, and thank you again to our panel for being here. Appreciate it.